There was a little boy. He went out and he was a shepherd. And the sheep were out, and he thought it would be really funny. And he said, what if I call a wolf? Now, if I cry a wolf, everybody will go, and it's so funny, and he cries a wolf, and everybody runs out. But what happened? What happened? Where's the wolf? There's no wolf. I was just joshing you. Listen, son. Please don't do that. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, he goes away. He does it again and again. Finally, the wolf does come, and nobody comes to help. And Aesop and his fable, that's the story. The message of Yitzvah, or Mitzvah, the law is don't be a liar. Because no one believes a liar even when they tell the truth. So you have the story. And you have the law. Now, in the Greek world, they have different names for them. Well, in a spaceship. Now, they would call them instead of uh, instructions or stories, which uh, the, the stories would be something like pala or masse, or uh, there, there's some other words for what those are. And then, and then mitzvah. Now, they would call them uh, the stories were called mythos. And the laws were called logos. And in these two, neither one was less valuable. And imagine, you're going to class, right? Some of you are teachers in school, you work in school today. And imagine you're in class and you're a teacher and you say to the kids, now yeah, listen kids, we're going to talk about lying today. It's really bad thing to lie. So what I want you to understand is that this little boy, and he cried wolf. And finally, when there was a wolf, he said wolf, and they didn't believe it. So don't lie. Because when you lie, people don't believe a liar even when they tell the truth. Now those kids are going to learn from them. So, wow, that's a powerful story. You know, they understand story. And so they go home, and they're talking to their parents. And they say, Mom, Dad, listen, I know that you're not supposed to lie. And, and if you do lie, the problem is that once you tell the truth, people don't believe you. Wow, that is wonderful. I'm so glad you learned that. How did you learn that? Oh, it was a story. It was a story about a little boy, and, and, and about, he was a shepherd, and there, there were these wolves, and, and, but he lied and said there were wolves, and then there were wolves, and, and then there was a wolf. And, what? What's your teacher's name? Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Michaelers. Mrs. Michaelers? I didn't even talk to her. Uh, we have a meeting, we have a meeting. This is my friend, right? So, so she comes and she sits down and we're talking. Now, I want to know where you got this story. Now, is that boy real? Is that a real boy? Now, where would that show sheep be? And aren't there even wolves in those woods? Don't you tell lies to my kids. But that's what we do with the story. First to the fourth centuries, zero to the to about three ninety nine. Um, most people were, were what you would call a classic pre millennialists, and this comes from the book of, of uh, Revelation, chapter twenty, verses one through seven. We hear about this thousand year reign of when the Messiah returns. Now. When the Messiah returns, there's there's <laughs> this thousand year reign. So how you interpret that is really important for how you understand life and death, and how life ends, and how this age is going to end, and, and and what do we stay here, or do we go away? Now there are a couple of quotes here I want us to see before I move on. I really like it. What we lack is not a will to believe, but a will to wonder. See, in the West, we want all the answers. It's great, I love it. I think, I've done this before, and people just love it. Doesn't that drive you crazy? I didn't finish it. Right? 
time to push the to finish our studies. We can sing the note. They don't have to play it. We don't have to have all the answers. But about a thousand years ago, there was a, uh, a person who, who argued, he was something of a literalist that we'll get to in just a second. And he said, well, you know, it's kind of a weird thing about, about the whole story of, uh, of Adam and Eve because what they wanted was knowledge. And they were like all the other animals. And finally, when they get the knowledge, they get banned. I mean, that's pretty stupid, don't you think? And so this ancient philosopher, they call Ram Bam, Mammonites. Uh, Mam he said, you appear to have studied the matter superficially. And nevertheless, you imagine that you can understand a book which has been the guide of past and present generations. When you for a moment withdraw from your lust and appetites and glance over its contents as if you were reading a historical work or some poetical composition. What he's saying to them is this. There are literal truths and there are concrete truths. Remember the scale armor? When you tell that story, right? when those first people, those first Jewish people heard those stories, they think in pictures. We want answers. We want words. And they, they thought in pictures. Those people immediately saw a correlation. Scales. Goliath represents the Satan. Goliath represents the enemy of God. He's like the serpent. Yes. The boy. He's like the smallest, tiniest nation. He's like Israel. And he's going out to conquer the evil of the world. Yes. Now, if anybody would have said, now show me where that Goliath is. Show me where he's here. I need some DNA. Show me that place. I've got to see that field. Those people would have looked at him like, it would have been the same as if you called somebody and said, my car's uh, got a flat tire. And they said, well, bring it on in. And then you say, well, okay. So you hang up. You call somebody. And you say, I've got to bring the tire in. So you take the tire off, bring the tire in, you bring the tire to him. They say, no, wait a minute. What kind of transmission did that car got? What? I didn't know what kind of transmission the car's had. I don't know. Well, how do I know that's a real tire? That has nothing to do with my flat tire. At all. But that's what we do to the stories. And there's a reason. And I'll tell you why. In those first four centuries, we had people called classic pre And they believed that what was going to happen is Jesus was going to return from that revelation portion. And then, and then after he returned, when he returns, all the Christians, the dead and the living, will reign with Christ. And that thousand years is symbolic, in a way. It's kind of literal, but it's more symbolic. It doesn't mean an actual thousand years. It just means for a long span of time. Now, then after that, from about the 5th century on, most people who called themselves Christians or amillennials. That means there is no millennium. That that thousand years is representative of, of all the time since Jesus came and, and started the kingdom. And from then on until he returns, that's the thousand years. It's a symbolic thousand years. And then around the 17th or 18th century, in um, the 18th and 19th century, we had people who were called post-millennialists, and they think that if we Christianize the whole world, the Messiah will return. So they're post. In other words, after the world has been Christianized, then Jesus will come back. He won't come back before that. He'll come back after that. And so we have the modern missionaries. And they go all over the world trying, trying to Christianize the world. And then finally, we have this thing in the 18th, 19th century that we call the age, the age of, of, of the awakenings. And in, the, in that time, science um, becomes very important. 
And so we, we start to learn about medicine, and we start to learn about germs, and we start to learn about outer space, and we start to learn lots of things. And so what happens is this very valuable part of our faith, mythos, becomes superstitious silliness for people who have no brains. The only thing that matters is the literal teaching. Teaching that has evidence. Don't you tell my kids about some boy and some wolf. Don't you tell my son about some Jesus walking on the water. Don't you tell my daughter about, about some uh, ocean being split. The only thing that matters is that we can prove it. It has to have evidence. And no time in history had anyone ever thought that way. They always understood the power of stories. If I, if I found out tomorrow that my parents had adopted me, and, and somebody came to me and said, you need to go do a dance. You need to make sure. Look, they raised me. They're my mom and dad. I don't care if I have the same genetics or not. They're my parents. And when somebody insisted, well, don't you go around telling my family they're your parents, because that's just a lie. They are my parents. There is value in the stories. There's concrete value in the stories. People really do come up against giants. And little people really do conquer when they follow the stories. If you can live the wisdom of the stories, you can understand why we have the laws. Without the stories, we just see speed limit signs. We need to see direct cars sometimes. And maybe they did put that up in the tree. Maybe it was never really, really a wreck at all. But it doesn't matter. What matters is the picture. What matters is what it shows us and how valuable it is for following the law. This is an open book. That's a literal truth. This, this book's open. Man is an open book. That's an abstract future. It's not a literal truth, but it's a concrete truth. It means that people, man is abstract, it's figured, and it represents all people. It means that people, pretty much what you see is what you get. That's what that means. There is truth in that. I don't have to prove it. I don't have to show you evidence. Now, if I say this is a book, then I need to show you this. This is a book. That's the law. That's the mitzvah. It's the literal truth. But there is concrete truth in the abstract truths. And the point is, is not to say that the stories aren't true. The point is, is to say, it doesn't matter to God if you think the stories are true, literally. What matters to God is that you use the stories to obey the law. There was a guy named Dr. Bob Ditter. And there are people in here who know Dr. Bob Ditter. Dr. Bob Getter come to camp. Right, right? And, and they have a video that's really exciting. You get to watch it about two hours of falsely. And uh, he would always teach camp staff because camp staff get in so much trouble working with teenagers. And he said the problem is that in the psychology of it, that most adults act like teenagers when they're around them instead of teenagers acting like adults. So he said, keep your eyes open, stay aware and alert. Don't let teenagers drag them into their world. And so, he would say this. Whenever you have to confront a teenager, one thing to know is this. Never give a teenager an audience. Because if you give a teenager an audience, they will put on a show. <laughs> right? Never say, hey, what are you doing in a cabin on your cell phone with your girlfriend? We're all out the pool. Get out there. Now, if there's other teenagers with me and say, No, my dad. 
Daddy, throw the cell phone down and brand it just for show. I'm going to shoot you from my cell phone. And a big show starts. And he said, so what that's all about is this. Every teenager has a brother. And it says, as soon as you ask them to do something, and you give them an audience, they take that rope and do this. And the temptation is to grab it. And I say, because I told you to, and I may not be your daddy, but and they're dragging you all over the cabin. <laughs> and you enter that world. And you said, I'm game, I'll debate with you, I'll play all. <coughs> And then during the Great Awakening, when they said the only thing that matters is logos, we said, okay, we'll play along. And what we ended up with was something called literalism. And literalism had two children. Atheism Fundamentalists. Both of these decided, let's take their role. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks. I have a pretty face that you need to see. No. And, and these two children here, look at her. No, she's been healed. And these two both are mirror images of each other. One says, it's all literal and it's hogwash. You can't split oceans. People can't walk on water. That's ridiculous. We're just going to get rid of all of it. Silly. On the other side, they said, no, no, no. It's all literal. And it's all true. The Bible says it. I believe it. What? That's it. So we had two outcomes of literalism. One is the fundamentalist. One is atheism. But both of them believe that the scriptures, every piece of them should be taken literally. There's a problem with that. There are many genres in the scripture. Throughout scripture, there's a narr there's a narrative, all kinds of prose. Uh, there are dreams. There's apocalyptic language. There is poetry, songs, epistles, and then in each of those, whether it's a letter or a, or a gospel or or an apocalyptic teaching. There's a mixture of all those other things. So to say it's all literal is to say when God said he covers it, me and his wings, it's because he's part chicken. You can't take all of it literally. It's not meant to be literal, but it is meant to be concrete. There is concrete truth in the fact that Jesus covers us in the shadow of or God does, which means he protects us. It's a concrete truth. It's <coughs> not meant to be taken literal. God's feathers don't show up in the first time. But God does protect us. There is concrete truth in the story. Now, moving right along, we're almost done. Um, what we end up with in this fundamentalism is this person named John Nelson Darby. John Nelson Darby came up with this great idea that we call the rapture. And it sells a lot of books and movies. The left behind stuff. Right? No time in history had anybody ever thought that when the Messiah returns, we go away. This is the first time, about 1850s, that this had ever been thought. And John called it dispensationalism or dispensational pre mill and me uh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Just trust me on that. <laughs> now, the difference between the dispensational premillennialist and the classic premillennialist is that this one, John said, Darby, Clinton, Darby, Darby said, Jesus will return, but all the people who are followers won't know he came back. And they'll look around, and suddenly the people who are saved, just their clothes will be there. And it'll be an airplane, a pilot will be gone, there's clothes will be there. 
And you look around, and some people will be there, but some people just their clothes are going to be there. Some of them are naked people. Well, they were there. No evidence whatsoever. Those people. And this is the first time anybody ever thought this way. And the reason why he thought this way is because he took the scripture so literally that he looked at passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And it says, And when Jesus returns, he will come on a cloud. And, and those who are a lot of dead will rise first. And then those who are living will rise after. They will meet him in the air. And wow, literal. Look at that literally. What a picture. I and mean, it's like we're all flying up in the sky. It's an amazing picture. And it was all over the world teaching this. And then people start to think, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, read it for yourselves. Right there in English, the problem was it's written in English. Mm -hmm. They were translated in English. Okay? And so then he says, well, it's got to be literal. You've got to take literal. The problem with that literal rendering of passages like that is that he forgets passages like Exodus 19, 19 through 25. It says, Moses went up into the cloud. And God said, when I blow the horn, then the people can rise up into the cloud. When the people heard these teachings the first time, those Jewish people knew the stories. They knew the stories. They said, wait a minute, wait a minute. John's revelation is telling us that Jesus, when he returns, will be God, and we will be invited to be with Him. That we can actually approach God in the fullness of His 